everybody. Welcome to this week's video lesson. I am so excited to paint this gorgeous mountain stream landscape for you today. I am using a piece of Le Carte paper, which does not take an alcohol wash well. And so if you are used to seeing me do some type of wet underpainting, today we're going to be working strictly with dry pastels. Le Carte paper does not accept any liquid. In fact, it will make the grit dissolve, which makes the paper pretty much unusable. And so right now I'm working, you can see that the paper is pre-toned. It's very, this very beautiful, warm, dark brown. And you can see the reference photo over there on the left is much cooler um, that you know just because of all the blues and greens and so I really want to talk specifically about bringing a lot of light into um, areas um, you know you can see the light that's splashing over the river um, across some of the grasses and the bushes and trees that are around and and also in in the distance and so i really thought that this warm brown would support that gorgeous light um, just really help us um, warm up the scene and just that just convey that gorgeous light that we are painting today I am mainly blocking in my deep dark shadows with some blue new pastel and just you know really looking at my reference photo you can see I'm, I keep looking down um, I'm wanting to open up the river a little bit at the bottom um, if, if a river is angled too far to the side which is normally how you know you can take photos of rivers because we don't usually take a photo reference while we're standing in a river but i like to open up the bottom of the rivers just so we can have a really nice entrance point for our viewers Now this month we have been talking about the middle distance and in this reference photo the middle distance is really a little bit past the bush in in the reference photo. You can see how the the darker foreground where the you know the river and the grasses especially in that right hand side um, riverbank are in the shadow. I want to pull people back into this landscape and the middle distance doesn't have to be far away. It's really just the idea of what is between near and far and in this case and for those of you that live in areas that are very deeply wooded and you have so many trees um, surrounding you that you can't even really see the far distance as far as I can I can see very far where I live this is a painting for you because I realize you know so many people they live all over in all different types of landscapes and sometimes the middle distance can be a little bit closer to you than um, you know than than maybe than maybe you think it should. And so in this case, I'm wanting you know the near the near foreground is this lower part of the river, the lower banks. Then the middle distance is just a little bit farther by those bushes and that deep bush, that deep um, shadow underneath the bush as it's sweeping down. Then there's that gorgeous, um, really beautiful. A splash of light that is right on that perfect spot on this river where the, the water is crashing over some rocks and then the far distance in this case would be more of the bridge and the distant trees so as I've been talking I am you can just you can see that the shape um, the shape of the the elements in the landscape are starting to form I'm using my new pastel to make a monochromatic um, general sketch I wouldn't call this an underpainting because I'm not going to be painting I'm making a monochromatic value sketch of the main elements in the scene I'm using you know my new pastel to make hard edges where the rocks are where the riverbank is more scumbled soft edges where the bushes you know that that um, darkness underneath that tree over on the right also the more linear upright structure of the you know big tree trunks off in the distance and then of course also the more um, you know the very boxy linear um, bridge off in the distance as well and all of this just really helps me form those dark shadows I like to work dark to light and it's the same way as I normally work I'm just not going to be applying the rubbing alcohol or any type of liquid 
And the paper itself is such a great medium value paper that it's going to really help support a lot of a lot of the pastel. It's it's going to become the dirt color, and you know it helps um, just just recreate some of the warmth that I'm wanting. You can see that I haven't applied any of this any of this dark pastel in areas where I really want some light to be. And so in this case, you can see the reference photo, there's not really, there's, you know, the light is mainly hitting the top of that tree as it sweeps across. And then that bottom uh, left hand side where there's kind of the triangle of stones and rocks. I'm going to be changing a little bit of where the light is playing to help guide the viewer backwards. And so in this case, underneath where the um, the large tree with the shadow over on the, the right hand side, I'm going to also be putting a little bit of light splashing across in front of it. And you can see that based on what I've just loosely put down because I didn't put any of that blue new pastel there. I left it that raw, really warm brown natural color of the paper. And so in those areas, I'm gonna be putting a little bit of light in front of that tree mass and behind that tree mass, filtering backwards into those distant trees that I'm working on right now. I've applied a little bit of very light, warm green, new pastel. That was the first green that I put down. And I'm scumbling just directly over a lot of those linear uh, up and down vertical marks that I made to sim you know, to symbolize the tree trunks. And then I can, I can, you know, make those marks right back over these greens. I'm really just wanting to weave those um, those colors and and thinking about um, you know how that light is really just hitting that far distance, and you can see I'm just putting in just gently um, you know scraping and um, using that hard hard edge of that new pastel to tap and pull my pastel directly down and across, softening a little bit of edges. And then I can work some greens back over it to make sure that the trunks look like they're woven in. I want to, to make the, the, you know, the boughs of these trees be in front of and behind. And so, you know, this is kind of a two step forward, one step back process. And so is, you know, it's kind of the same thing as putting in sky holes. You have to put them in and then sometimes you have to step back and soften them a little bit, maybe place some leaves over them, scumble them off. It's just going back and forth and making sure that you are leaving enough tooth. And so using a very, very light touch here pulling right that you know those um, bright very light values right back scumbling them over and around some of those trunks that I just put in that helps um, nestle those trunks into the distant foreground I don't want them to be too uh, prominent but I do want it to read as you know definitely a forest way back there just really trying to focus on getting the light correct going to start working in a few sky holes here. I like to um, just make some little marks, especially um, to symbolize that there are trunks and that there are you know sky holes around the trunks. I kind of flick and pull down. And then I usually like to soften a little bit by tapping with my finger. So I will make those marks on either side of those darker vertical marks just to help show showcase a little bit of that feeling of that tall forest. And I'll be working on that periodically, adding some different blues and greens into, into that distant part, but I wanna start working on that, that shadow area of that tree over there on the right and just gonna start working my way down the painting. This is a softer dark blue pastel that mirrors the um, original dark blue new pastel that I put down for my first initial sketch. Now I'm working in a little bit 
of a very cool dark green that's a very similar value and remember value is the relative lightness or darkness of a color it doesn't really have anything to do with um, the t color temperature it's about if you were to you know convert all the colors into black and white where on the value scale would it be would it be closer to pure black would it be closer to pure white and all the colors in between and I like to work very incrementally up the value like up up a ladder and so I work usually with a very cool color initially especially for my dark um, shadows uh, in the landscape. I like to use dark blues and then I'll work my way up very slowly in areas where I want to, um, you know, start to get a little bit more realistic with my color, you actually using greens, um, working also a little bit warmer, warmer and lighter in value. So right now I'm using a warmer green that's a little bit of a step up from that dark green that I used. And so really when you lay your pastels out and you see them in your palette box, or if you have them, if you haven't taken them out of your palette box and you keep them in the cardboard box, that's fine too. Um, look at them, you know, you can even take a picture of your palette box and turn it into black and white. And that's a great way to see the values of the colors that you have. And now in this area, this is where some of my light is going to be. And so I'm immediately, it doesn't have a dark shadow color to it right now. Um, that little brown, you know, area that I, that I pointed out, this is where it's different than the reference photo. I'm pulling some light to surround that bushy tree. I'm going to put some in front of it and behind it. That's going to help us pull the eye back. Also going to add a little bit of warmth off in the distance with that same very warm green. It's actually green. It's not yellow. It looks very yellow. There's a lot of yellow in it. And especially because of that brown paper, it makes it look even brighter. So you can see how having those darker colors and then immediately, you know, putting in areas that are much lighter and warmer in color the color temperature it automatically just almost looks like the paper starts to glow and a lot of that is to do with this beautiful dark brown base that we have it's just really fun to paint these effects I'm gonna start putting in some of my river now this is a dark turquoise new pastel I usually like to start off with the harder pastels especially initially because I can really control how much pastel is, is, is being put onto the paper. When you start with a very soft pastel and you're not used to them or you're a beginner or you haven't quite developed that soft touch, sometimes you can get a little too, like just too much heaviness in the pastel. And then it's difficult to layer because you've used up all the tooth that your paper has. And if you look at paper and you know under a microscope it looks like a mountain range and those valleys between the mountains that's where the pastel settles down well when you fill that valley up to the tops of the mountains then it's very difficult to keep layering pastel and so using a light touch using harder pastels initially saving those really soft pastels until those final highlight touches that will help you really um, just create a very vibrant scene versus a muddy scene. Whenever you have a reference photo of a rushing river like this, it's very important to really study the deeper shadow areas, the colors that are in it, because they're not just blue. There's a lot of green in water, especially when it's surrounded as, in, as is in this case with a lot of green. And so I love to, um, I love to paint water. It's just, it's such a joy. And of course, those gorgeous blues that we're going to put in towards, you know, just throughout this, this fun lesson, um, just, just brings me so much happiness. We, um, you know, water, I think is one of the most compelling, compelling aspects of painting any type of landscape. People are drawn to water. Of course, water is life and painting these gorgeous using these gorgeous blues and greens um, just are just so much fun 
I also really think about whenever I'm painting a scene like this, where um, I want to symbolize if the water is a little bit deeper, where is it in shadow, where is it in light? Because all of those things really, you know, just like in in a grass area, it affects what color the, the water looks like. And so you can see I where I wanted to put that water or that light in front of the bush, I'm kind of moving down. I'm kind of like took picked up that that little you know, spit of light that's in the reference photo where the where the little waterfall is. And I just picked it up and I moved it down a little bit right by that light that I have going on in on that um, right hand shore. And that just helps just support the feeling of this light sweeping across whenever you have areas that are that are also that are lit right next to each other so that that bank is lit the water is lit i'm going to put some light across on the other side as well i'm lightening up my pastels very very gradually i'm looking very closely at how the water is rushing and rolling around. Usually when you're painting some type of little waterfall, the white water is, is more purely white at the base of the waterfall where it's actually foaming and uh, like a little bit above it, it's darker. And then right behind sometimes those areas, like right now I'm putting in some gold. That's because those rocks are very shallow there usually and so especially if there's light pouring in, you're going to have a little bit of those rocks showing the rock colors. And in this case, and where, where these, um, this reference is that, you know, those rocks really are very warm. And so really zoom in on those very specific areas and that will really help you with your water. I'm continuing to fill in my water. So I'm looking at the difference of the colors where the water is in, more in shadow, which is where my foreground is. You can see that there's a little bit of very um, dappled light at the very, very base of the river as it's coming towards me. I'm not gonna put that in because I think it would pull the eye a little bit too much. But right next to the shoreline where you know the rocks are really dark, the, the water is just this blue ultramarine, beautiful. And as the water goes across the river more towards the left, it becomes a little grayer and a little bit more neutral. And so I'm really carefully looking, I'm squinting down at my reference. I am not going to put in every single rock that is in this scene, especially over on the left hand side in that, you know, kind of triangle at the front. I'm going to make that more grasses just because that's how I prefer to um, create my paintings for rivers. I like the grasses. I like to put rocks around, but um, the grasses to me are a little bit more fun to paint. I'm also wanting to make sure that as I'm painting backwards and as the river, the river is actually rushing towards me, I want to make sure that as I paint backwards, little ripples, that they get thinner and um, don't look as you know quite as wide as the, as the ripples that are closer to me. That's another way to indicate distance. Right now I'm thinking in my head, I used some kind of a light turquoisey blue for the sky holes initially, and I've been putting a lot of ultramarine blues, cobalt blues into the water. And so I'm just pushing a little bit of those different color temperatures of blues up into the sky because I thought that they didn't really go together. And so those are, you know, just evaluating constantly your painting, self-critique, what color, you know, are the color temperatures, are they, are they, are they getting along? Um, and so oftentimes I will, I'll put a blue in the sky, I'll put some in the water and then I'll, I'll, I'll mix them a little bit. I'll put whatever I've in the sky down in the water and vice versa. And that just helps them go along. Sometimes, obviously in this case, I'm not using quite as dark of a blue or a dark value because I want the sky to be lighter, obviously. And, but it's the same color temperature, the same color family of blues. I'm still working on um, just the grasses and right now I'm going to start putting in some of the rock values. Now rocks, um, they're a, you know, 
they can be either difficult to paint or very hard to paint depending on your approach. I like to try to take a very simple approach and think of them just as blocky planes where there is um, part in shadow, part in light, and maybe a medium, a medium tone. A little light, a little dark, and a little medium. Um, so usually, of course, what is nearer the ground, nearer, nearer the water is dark what is angled towards the light is a little bit lighter and sometimes there is a third angle that's you know still upwards it's pointing towards the sky but maybe at a slightly different angle that's my medium tone so i really like to just pick about three grayer um you know grayer tones and just using pretty angular strokes indicate the rocks i don't overthink rocks i don't try to um, overanalyze them i I kind of want them to be um, kind of in the background of somebody's idea of what they are. I, I don't, um, you know, necessarily want people to look at them. That's it's just a you know a part of the landscape that's important, especially on a rocky river like this, to indicate them. But remember, impressionism is a suggestion of a thing. We don't have to be so worried about being tediously tediously recreating exactly what that rock looks like. We just want to have the feel of a rocky river. And so simple, simple marks is, you know, the simpler, the better. And, um, you know, because especially in this piece, the rocks are in the foreground and I'm wanting people to go more back, more back into the painting. And so the simple marks help. And of course, man-made objects, very, very straight lines, pull out my ruler just to make sure that I'm pretty, you know, I'm, I have a, a nice horizontal bridge. That bridge um, is kind of a beloved bridge in my family. This reference photo, which I didn't really mention, was from some family cabins that have been in uh, my husband's family since the 1930s. And this bridge is is almost like a, you know, the entrance to Shangri-La to a lot of to a lot of the family. Um, it's you know a bridge that we cross to get to peace and to just a little bit of relaxation at some really lovely cabins in the northern New Mexico mountains. And so it's important that I put that in because it's just so symbolic of this area. You can see how thin my my little ripples are as I go back. That's a Mount Vision that I'm using. So I'm getting a little bit softer, especially at the, you know, the lighter highlight colors. I'm getting a little bit softer than my initial darker pastels. Flicking, pushing and flicking down to indicate that white water. Also going to bring out a pencil. Now this isn't a normal technique that a lot of people see. I'm not really using the pencil to mark as much as I'm using it to help me maybe straighten some lines and to actually remove a little bit of pastel. It's the same technique when I very first started on YouTube. I used to use a palette knife a lot and everybody was very mystified. I got so many messages back then about why is she using a palette knife? And it was really because I liked um, how it removed some of the pastel, but left also a lot of pastel. It was almost like, um, you know, almost scratch art, scratching, scratching the layers of the pastel to reveal what was underneath. And I have also found that using a graphite pencil, especially on Le Carte, it doesn't really lay down the graphite, but that very, very fine tip of that graphite, of that, of that mechanical pencil lead, removes just a very thin line of pastel and creates an effect that I really enjoy. And so I'm not really marking with that graphite. I was removing some pastel. Okay, I'm going to still continue. I'm going to work a little bit more on some of the shore, that that beautiful riverbank. That's a very very warm new pastel. Once again, I love the I love the harder pastels, 
and I'm trying, I'm getting a little bit uh, more detailed here with my marks to indicate more individual grasses. Before it's just been general color, just scumbling it in, getting the color like I like it. Now I want to add a little bit more of a flare of detail. Getting a little bit smaller. I'm working big to small, large shape to small shape. I have quite a bit of brown still showing and so I'm going to be working on um, covering that a little bit. I like, I love the brown. I think it really helps support the piece, but I want it to feel a little greener. Right now, here you can see me, I'm putting on that third highlight color of the rocks, like I mentioned. Really being careful here to make very angular marks, and then I like to soften the mark. Just swiping with my finger. Looking down a lot because I want to make sure I have kind of my main rocks that I want in the piece. There's a lot of them. <laughs> Rocks were something that were very intimidating to me when I very first began to paint. But once I learned to really break them down into three values, making them very angular marks, and I just kind of stopped fussing about trying to make them perfect, um, then it was quite a bit easier for me to paint them. So just keep trying. Try not to overthink your elements. Think of them as shapes instead of objects. Look at the shapes of those, the highlights on the rocks versus the shape of the shadow of the rocks and just paint the shapes. Paint the correct value, the correct shapes, and you will have a much easier time painting those rocks. Also just very slightly indicating the edges, the, the brighter areas of that distant bridge. How it overhangs and adds that deep shadow, but then there's also the area that is, you know, more on this this side which would be more in the light of course it's a concrete um, structure and so it's definitely very man-made but i also want to nestle it into the landscape as well still working on my treetops trying to get a little bit of the brown out of them especially towards the top of the trees really just kind of working all over right now whenever I step back I have mentioned before how I have my palette box behind me and to my right and so whenever I go to pick up a color that I've used or a new color I can turn around and see the see the painting from a distance and it really helps me kind of squint down or un, you know just soften the focus of my vision to really help see what needs work, what's working, what's not working, what is jumping out a little bit too much. Um, are my values correct? Does the light line up with each other? Those things are all things I'm constantly thinking about as I'm painting. You can see how angular some of those marks are that I'm making for the rocks. I'm pushing hard too. I'm making a much more definite, um, not trying to glaze the color whenever I'm marking, and indicating those deeper shadows. Getting very slow and steady here. You know, sometimes the very beginning of a painting is quickly just, you know, gesturing in those shapes, getting that color down. 
um, being spontaneous. Well, as you keep going, things start to focus in a little bit, tunnel vision (laughs) of a certain area. And being, you know, self self critiquing or self critical and not being critical in that, oh gosh, this is terrible. I, I hate this painting. But critical in that am I am I translating the scene the way I envisioned in the first place? Am I translating the light the way I wanted to? Am I bringing people backwards towards that middle and that distance instead of letting them sit in the foreground? And this is a very close scene. This isn't one, you know, with majestic mountains off in the distance or rolling hills or even canyon walls. This is a little bit closer, but that was the whole point. I wanted you who live in these very wooded areas to think of your landscape and what is before you in three parts, the foreground, the mid ground, and the very distance. Uh, Because that just helps guide your viewer. Once again, think of your painting as a, as a three-part three part harmony. I'm working in some varying color temperatures into the grasses, some really cool, bright values, and also those really warm values that just helps bring a little bit of character into the grasses so it doesn't look like it's all one type of grass obviously where I live in the southwest we have a lot of cool sages and cactuses that are very cool in color now this is a specific area as I was really looking closely at the falls how I noticed that right past that right right before the water drops down it's a little bit darker um, than the other blues. It, there's just a darkening of the water. Um, and so I'm just wanting to indicate that that's the blue new pastel. It also helps um, kind of form a transition, just um, a nice contrast between the, the, the whiter water. Although it's not white, I didn't use any white, it's all blue. It's just varying values of blue. One of my very favorites, and I've mentioned it many times here on The Beauty of Pastel, is that Best of the Blues collection by Terry Ludwig, which is a fantastic color range of ultramarines, cobalts, turquoises, dark blues. There are some turquoise in there. He also has a turquoise set collection. I don't have that one, but I've always wanted it. starting to add just some little touches of other areas that are a little bit of white water, just that same effect that I mentioned in my recent um, field, grassy field lesson where, you know, we want to have cookie crumbs that lead us towards, towards the back, towards the, um, just into the piece. And so cookie crumb, your, your light, backwards and that will really help sprinkle that beautiful light all around. Gentle scumbles across just to help glaze the color. That is a soft pastel, but if you use a light touch, it doesn't lay it down too much and you can still see all of the different hue nuances that you have going on in your piece. Making some fun little definite mark, you know, marks. It's almost, we have to think of our, of our pastels as brushes. We love brush strokes in oil paintings and so we have marks in our pastels. Let's put up the black tape and just see what it can reveal, what we need to work on a little bit. I'm gonna put a little bit of purple off into the distance just to help some of those those trees have a little bit more, um, you know, there's some that are forward and some that are even behind those trees. I'm also going to add a little bit of golden um, pastel into the, the this you know this um, areas of light 
instead of just warm greens, yellow really helps um, pinpoint light. And especially in this case, the darkness of the paper that's very warm brown, it's really kind of a very, very, very dark golden paper. And so this yellow um, really helps those those colors get along just that just brings out a little bit more punch of light I love to paint and embroider in this light especially with yellow and blue of course that's a beautiful color combination it's really compelling gorgeous complementary colors cools and warms also going to bring in some darker deeper blues just at the base of the painting sweeping it across and down fill that in a little bit and I'm going to keep that bottom um, left brown greens pretty much that way I'm not going to indicate those really bright rocks because I don't want the eye to go there and so keeping it pretty muted will help um, people kind of skip over that area. It's there and it's in our periphery, but it's not the main thing we want people to look at. Still working a little bit on just some final grassy details. And that is it, everybody. I hope you have loved watching this. I had so much fun painting this. This is a beautiful area. I wish I could go visit it. Of course, during this time, it's harder to travel. And so how do we best travel? We, we paint the places we love that bring us joy and memory and happiness. And I hope you enjoyed it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you check out the blog post so you can see my palette and the materials I've used. You can also download this reference for your own practice. And I love to see your versions of these lessons. Thank you so much for being here and I hope you all have a fantastic week.